In the last unit, we learned about momentum, which describes the amount of movement in a system as a vector with some direction and strength. It's great for thinking about the average movement over all the objects, but there's some things it doesn't capture. For example, we considered two identical objects traveling towards each other at the same speed and determined the system's net momentum was zero. And yet, movement and counter movement still occurred. Giant particle accelerators consume a small city's worth of energy to smash pairs of particles like this together at speeds approaching that of light. Even if the motion in these examples cancels itself out momentum-wise, there's clearly something movement-related going on here worth measuring. That thing is energy. Unlike momentum, energy isn't just about movement. It measures anything that can perform useful work. It takes energy to lift an object, to make a noise, to power a light bulb. Thus, the unit of energy, the joule, is scalar. It has magnitude, but not direction. Kinetic energy is the energy of movement. For now, we'll focus on the energy an object has while traveling through space, called translational kinetic energy. The expression for it is 1 half mv squared. So, energy increases as an object's mass increases, and increases rapidly as an object's speed increases. The translational kinetic energy of a system is simply the sum of the energies of each object. The energy of our particle accelerator system is mv squared, not zero. Objects that aren't moving can still have energy. An object held at a height will, once dropped, gain kinetic energy as it falls back to the ground. The act of lifting the object stores future kinetic energy inside of it. Energy captured by working against Earth's gravity is called gravitational potential energy, and is given by the product of the object's mass, its distance from the ground, and the Earth's gravitational acceleration. Roller coasters and hydroelectric dams exploit the dance between kinetic and potential energy for fun and for profit. Now, it turns out that the Earth isn't some magic object attractor. Any two objects with mass attract each other via the fundamental force of gravity. Fundamental here being code for. It just happens, I guess. We can thank Newton for this one too. Newton's law of universal gravitation states that gravitational attraction is proportional to the masses of each object and inversely proportional to the distance between them. Here, big G is the gravitational constant, and it is tiny. Because of this, we can only observe gravity in day-to-day -day life when massive, planet-sized objects like the Earth are involved. Gravity does attract human-sized objects together, but measuring this attraction is extremely finicky. Another way of storing potential energy is by deforming an object, for example, compressing a spring. This is elastic potential energy, given by the formula 1 half kx squared, where k is the object's spring constant and x is the distance of deformation. Gee, these two energy formulas look awfully similar. I wonder why that's the case. A system's mechanical energy is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of each component. Mechanical energy only changes when a force is applied over some distance, just like velocity. This force does work, which equals force times distance. So, work is the area under a force distance curve. Like anything involving forces, we use a free body diagram to suss out the net force. Only the component of this force in the direction of displacement contributes to the work done. A force is conservative when its effect on the system is equal to the difference between the system's initial and final energy. Notice that the path taken to get from the initial state to the final state doesn't matter. Any path between these two states represents the same amount of work. I wonder where that idea comes from. Non-conservative forces are the problem children that often get ignored. Friction, air resistance, and the like. The sharp eye among you may have noticed that work and energy have the same units. The work energy theorem states that the net work done on a system is equal to the change in its mechanical energy. The theorem also implies that, unlike kinetic energy, work can be negative. Applying a force that slows an object down does negative work. If no work is done, the work energy theorem suggests that a system's mechanical energy stays constant. In other words, energy itself cannot be created or destroyed, just converted between different forms. This is the famous conservation of energy. Collisions that conserve mechanical energy are called elastic. Power is energy transferred over time. One watt of power is one joule of energy per second. Anything that continuously produces, or converts energy, like an engine, is described by its power. We can determine the total energy transfer over a period of time by multiplying the source's power by the time period's length. Finally, since work done is the net change in energy, we rearrange terms to find that power is force times the parallel component of velocity. In conclusion, energy is a fundamental theme throughout physics and may very well be the most important idea that AP Physics 1 introduces. In this video, we only covered energy related to movement, but it pops up everywhere, as heat, as electricity, as chemical bonds, as the protest against entropy. Although the plans for the universe may be written in math, energy is what makes it all happen.